I know. Okay, so all of you do have the discussion questions. And as Jill um, pointed out, doesn't mean we have to go through them one by one, but I am just curious as we look at the, the first question, if we could maybe go around, uh, introduce ourselves and then um, let us know if, you know, your program has an emergency respite and how you define that. Maybe that's just a good um, start for us to do an introduction as well as answer that first one. And I'm happy to go first. Um, so our program does have an emergency respite uh, voucher. It's actually uh, $300. And it is for those um, unplanned, unexpected um, events. And uh, sometimes um, it is, you know, even for the family caregiver to have to have a surgery or a medical procedure unexpected. Um, although those are planned, they have to have care for their loved one. And it also allows us some flexibility uh, because we do try to match those family caregivers with other statewide respite programs. We actually have the lifespan respite voucher program, as well as our systems of care um, mental health, uh, mental and behavioral health services respite voucher program. So our team is knowledgeable of other statewide respite programs and we coordinate across those programs. But what's great about having the emergency voucher, it allows us some flexibility. So depending on what that unexpected unplanned event is, even if they're eligible or a match for another program because of that circumstance and perhaps the match is unable to assist them right then we are in a position to be able to assist them as well as connect them obviously with um, the other respite voucher program for ongoing respite um, so and so yeah uh, so Aita Stevens, I'm the director for Sooner Success. I am also a parent of four, and our oldest has a rare chromosome anomaly, so I'm also a family caregiver. So who wants to volunteer to go next? I'll go next. My name's Cheryl Donnell. Um, I'm with the Nevada Lifespan Respite Care Coalition. I'm the executive director. Uh, I am a caregiver of uh, myself. Um, I have a, a son who's 30, 32 with multiple disabilities. And then I have aging parents, um, both in their 80s, uh, where I am not an in-home in caregiver, but certainly providing some support uh, to them as well. And you, and you know about our emergency program because they just presented, so. <laughs> I'll go next. Um, I'm Megan Bettinger. I'm the program manager for the Colorado Respite Coalition. And we do not have an emergency respite program, but I'm very, this is very interesting. So um, that's, we, we have the life, we have the lifespan grant, so. And that's why I love the collaborative is really sharing and exchanging yeah. those ideas. Um, Abby? Hi, I'm Abby Deraponsini from the New York State Office for the Aging. Um, I work on the National Family Caregiver Support Program, Older Americans Act um, at NISOFA, and we don't offer emergency respite vouchers right now, but we are working on program standards for the program, and we plan to offer um, respite vouchers and an emergency respite component in the future. So that's something we're working on, but um, the coalition that we contract with for the Lifespan Respite Grant they offer respite vouchers and they do offer emergency respite. I'm not sure exactly how they define it, but I know that they do um, offer vouchers if there is an emergency. Great. And Yasmin, I know you also presented. Was there anything you wanted to add? Um, I'm also a caregiver myself. I have a 13 year old um, kiddo who has autism. Um, and um, I also help take care of my mom who's, um, you know, aging, but still needs assistance. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I enjoyed 
yours and Cheryl's uh, presentations again. I think it's great that Jill uh, has these platforms because really um, with other programs that we have, I feel like the support is there nationally uh, because of these connections too. Just being able to share things, share forms, share surveys, share ideas, whatever that is. Um, so the second one is how do you screen family caregivers for emergency respite voucher use? So I feel like, again, because the way we've set it up, it's less restrictive. So it does allow us flexibility, which again, those that don't have a, an emergency voucher program and are thinking about it, not having so many restrictions has allowed us to really broaden who uh, we can help, which I appreciate because like calls we may get, they, you know, family caregivers are in a crisis. Um, of course, not always, but that's really what's so helpful um, the way we've set it up like that. And, and it's not a lot of money, but it's at least something. Again, it's 300 um, elites. It is at least something while we're also trying to help them work through if there are other resources to connect them with. So, um, so that the screening of family caregivers, was that something that Cheryl or Yasmin, you wanted to add to that? I know you had some of that in your presentations already. Yeah, um, I typically do a lot of my uh, case management in terms of um, sometimes my my conversation begins with just a couple of demographic questions from that referral form. And in those conversations, it's, you know, gone from 15 minutes to 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. So it's really digging deep and figuring out, okay, since when have you not received support? Um, what happened in your life? And so um, figuring out, are you caring for more than one individual? Um, who is providing support for yourself as well, because that's extremely important is, you know, you can't, you can't help anybody else if you can't receive some form of relief um, or medical attention to themselves and, and having some form of health care, um, emotional care, self-care that they could continue to follow through with their caregiving journey. Um, so, I guess in my screening, it's it's a lot of conversation, um, and and sometimes you know that one phone call can turn into a couple a week just because um, they're really just not feeling that supported in, in their community, um, especially when I speak to caregivers in the rural areas, um, they don't have anything really set for communication, for venting, for caregiving support. There's no support groups. Um, so. Well, I think uh, the screening is basically to determine if the emergency respite funding is the right resource to get to them. And that's a very person-centered planning mm -hmm. um, approach. Uh, and that's why it takes a little while. Uh, it, it's worth the investment of time um, rather than just, you know, Vouchers tend to just throw money at people. That doesn't necessarily mean they solve the problems that are going on in their lives. So I think that's important. Okay. Um, the next question is, do you offer emergency respite to assist in the prevention of abuse or neglect when a high-risk family is identified? You know, um, I would say yes, um, but it's usually more of, family caregiver like burnout, like there's really maybe a heightened um, reason that they really desperately need that break. And so I, I feel that uh, although we may not define it and term, use that terminology in terms of assist in the prevention of abuse and neglect, um, I feel that it's it is, but respite's already always been associated with a, a, re, a reduction or prevention of abuse and neglect because um, burnout caregivers um, need that kind of 
uh, protection. Otherwise, those things uh, tend to creep in. So I don't know that we have anything, uh, yeah, as you can correct me about that has that language. I do know we're really moving into mental health aspects quite a bit and a dual diagnosis. So there might be a mental health and a, um, a developmental disability uh, combo and that, um, that there's some challenges because providers of mental health don't feel comfortable handling the developmental disabilities and vice versa that people with uh, that are used to providing um, for developmental disabilities are not sure how to handle the mental health aspects of, uh, of care. So I think there's some training issues there, but as far as um, abuse and neglect, I think that's kind of built into um, it respite, the respite world anyway, but that would be my, my take on it. And I just wanted to share um, in New York, our lifespan respite team just recently had a meeting with um, the Community Based Child Abuse Prevention Bureau in the Office of Children and Family Services. And um, we kind of, you know, talked about the voucher program that is available through NYSERC, and they're going to be sharing that information with their local community partners. So, great. Megan or Yasmin, did you want to add to that? No, Cheryl covered it, covered it for what we're trying to accomplish in Nevada too. Great. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is really about engaging, educating family caregivers. What do you see as the primary barriers for family caregivers in seeking and using emergency respite voucher? And again, I'm happy to answer that uh, first. Honestly, so many times family caregivers are just unaware of what resources are available. Um, and as we all know, um, they're overwhelmed. And so even if somebody happened to tell them about a program, um, I know it's a lot of times it's about timing. It's about just really having a sensitive one-on-one -on -one conversation to where they do open up. Um, and so I recognize as much as our team is out there across the state, um, including in rural Oklahoma, we're trying to get the information out there. But I think that's a huge barrier is just family caregivers don't know about um, respite or other resources. Who would like to go next? I can go. I would also say that it's the, you know, like we all know, it's the caregivers that don't realize that they need some help too. I would say that's a huge barrier, <laughs> convincing them that they need the help or they should accept the help. Yeah. I, just the awareness. I mean, we're always dealing with the word respite that no one knows what that means. Um, so unless they're in, in, in that world, um, they, they don't use that word. So um, hearing about an emergency respite uh, program sometimes has to overcome that barrier to begin with. Mm -hmm. But um, I also wonder how many hands that they've turned to, uh, people that they've asked, where, where do I go? Where do I look? And they didn't know where to go. And I, I wonder um, how many times, um, I mean, they, it's nice that they'll tumble into our no wrong door system in some fashion, but mm -hmm. how many people stores did they knock on before they got to that? Did they go to, you know, did they have a case manager or did they go to a doctor or, or you know, who did they talk to first about the, the issues um, and um, how many pass offs were made in order for them to get to the right program to begin to explore really what the need was. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with um, what everyone has shared, but and also I think the caregiver self identification is an issue too. I think a lot of times people don't identify themselves as caregivers and they don't realize that those resources again are available for them. Yeah, I'm coming from personal experience myself as a caregiver. Um, I started, you know, kind of just knocking on pediatricians offices and going the medical route of figuring out, okay, where do I begin? I know there's something wrong. I know I need support, but I don't know where to even begin. Um, and so it took a long time figuring out, oh my gosh, there's actually all of these supports um, 
and organizations that, that are able to help. Um, I unfortunately never qualified for them because I was a working parent. So, but it's always nice to refer. I wondered, you didn't uh, report in your, in your statement, but I think language is always a barrier. Um, uh, and you speak Spanish, don't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we had a person already on staff who could handle Hispanic uh, family requests. I don't know if there were any other languages that you had a request for um, that you couldn't provide yourself uh, that were non-English speaking. Did you work through any other interpreter type services? Do you know how many families needed another language other than English? Uh, at the top of my head, I believe I had three applicants. And again, I think that's um, a barrier, regardless of where you live. Uh, obviously, um, when states can provide translation, um, it's, you know, we certainly, we have on staff bilingual Spanish speaking coordinators, um, but Cheryl raises a good point for other languages. I know we have a resource that we could use. I'll be honest, it's, it's not great just because uh, it makes a huge difference. I think when you speak the language and you can explain it to the parent in a way that they can understand, you're really relying on someone else to do their best to you know, translate it. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely agree. That's a barrier for sure. Uh, whether it's an emergency respite voucher program or just providing uh, respite support, generally speaking. Okay, I don't know how we're doing. We're, we got about five more minutes. Um, so as we look through the remaining questions, um, are there, is there one in particular? I mean, we could go out of order. Is there one in particular that stood out that you would hope that we could discuss? Uh, the partnership one um, stood out to me, but I like the one about um, thinking about emergencies in general. There, I mean that from having um, a health emergency to a natural disaster. That's a full range of things. And I can remember during uh, we had COVID, obviously, but we also had wildfires in our state during that time period. And I remember talking to families who were being evacuated. They didn't have an option to stay at home and get services there. They had to go somewhere else. And they were trying to figure out how to put all the equipment in the car with them and the dogs and the and get out of there. And um, I'm wondering whether or not they needed to, you know, if the portable was going to be sufficient to get them to where they could get hooked into something, um, you know, like an oxygen tank or, um, you know, the various type of equipment that the that a care recipient might need. And, and so having that broader discussion about emergencies and what those might look like and having like multiple approaches to that. Um, I know that I worked independently. This is part of my career life uh, as a life planner, um, consulting uh, with families on how to build emergency plans and figure out what kind of things needed to happen, what, what needed to be grabbed, what was the plan if, Situation A occurs, situation B occurs, and have some backup plans. And I don't think we do that with our families. Their, you know, their their time and energy is spent so much in just the day to day care um, that when when we get them uh, thinking much beyond what they're just doing to keep their head above water is is uh, really is not been um, even captured until there is an emergency. And then we're saying, why didn't we know, or why didn't we plan, or why didn't we think through things, or why didn't we consider what our options were? You know, gosh, we do better at, at knowing what to do with animals during a wildfire than we do with um, what to do with people who are on oxygen and need to evacuate. So, I mean, there's just some of those other things that, that are, are captured in emergency planning that we need to be thinking about as well. Great points and we are out of time guys. So thank you so much. Thank you.